Well, let's introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is someone I've had the privilege of knowing for over a decade now and working with, and someone I have the utmost respect for as a data scientist, as you know, a geek among geeks, but also a very switched on, high IQ, capable businessman, which is why Daniel is the uh, director a director, probably the director, of, uh, of uh, is it still called Advanced Quantitative Advisory? Uh, analytic and Quantitative Advisory. Analytic and Quantitative Advisory at, uh, at Ernst & Young, Australia. Uh, Daniel, had, like I said, he's a geek's geek. He really knows his machine learning. He loves online and offline games. He just got his pilot's license. He's, he's just had a baby. This has real, been a real year of first for Daniel, and now, this is his first uh, Data Science Sydney presentation. So uh, over to you, Daniel. OK. So tonight, I'm going to talk about model selection, um, which hopefully some of you know something about. Maybe a few of you know a lot about it. Um, but it, it's an area that I think is actually quite fascinating and, and I've kind of been a little bit inspired in this area by reading some of the stuff from Elements of Statistical Learning, Chapter 7 in particular, which is a, a fantastic chapter about all of the sorts of things here. But it's, it's one of those things that's um, you know, kind of really, really important um, uh, when, when we're doing our analysis. Um, why is it important? Well. Model selection, it's about, you know, we get the right model, we get improved business outcomes, hopefully we actually get the right model so we can get it implemented. But for me, the, the thing that is, is kind of always at the back of my mind is, is this whole thing about avoiding overfitting, yeah? Um, we're humans, we're, we're people who are really good at picking up patterns, yeah? And, and doing things, and you know, if we can see something in the data, we'll go, oh yeah, there's a pattern there. Um, but often we see patterns when they aren't there. And, and one of the big risks, and one of the things that's really difficult to actually sort of prepare for when you're doing data science is we have this data, we have this data that describes what happened in the world prior to this point in time. And we do some good stuff around how we actually set up that data, partitioning it into our test and training sets, doing out of time testing and things like that. But our big fear is that the data that we've got before isn't representative of what comes out in the future. And so we've got this, this thing that we don't have data on, which is the future. And we make this big assumption that what we've seen in the past is going to be representative of what we see in the future. But there's some things about the data that we've already got that are specifics. They're the tweaks, the nuances, the things that are specific to the individual data set that we've got. And if we're not careful, because we've got some really powerful tools and techniques these days, we can actually crank the lever up a bit too far and crank it too far in the way of matching the data that we've got and not what's coming in in the future. So, I mean, if you're... There's a really interesting article that came out. I've got a guy talking about his reflections as being a data scientist in, in Twitter. He talked about type A and type B data scientists. You know, he talked about... A type A data scientist, and I'd probably put myself in this category, they're the analysts. They're the people who are going and solving you know, different sorts of problems. It's one-off sorts of analyses. It's investigating, doing interesting things, solving individual business problems. And then your type B data, <laughs> data scientists, well, these are the people who are a little bit more like engineers, yeah? These are the people, and there's some people, you know, looking down here at Andre, you know, there's some people in this room who are at that end. They've come to it from possibly more of a computer science background, but these people are like, yep, yeah, okay, we get the machine learning, we want to crank this out, we want to industrialize this, we want to automate the decision making in our organization, we want to get this happening really well. And so these guys are building the data pipelines, building the feature libraries, building the automated model selection stuff that's actually going to be cranking out models without human intervention. Okay, so I mean, this is really exciting stuff, you know, has the opportunity to sort of really transform how our business is working, but it's also somewhat risky stuff, yeah? Because if we're automating it, if we get it right, we get it right thousands and thousands of times, yeah? We, we get it right. If we make some mistakes of the logic when we come to model selection and that, 
we can automatically make ourselves wrong many thousands of times over. So model selection is important for both the type A and the type B data scientists. So that's a little bit of a motivation as to why I think this is interesting going forward. So I'm, I'm going to talk through a couple of things today and let's have a look. So I'm, I'm going to look at a couple of different aspects of selections. Can everyone read that? Or is that a bit tiny weeny small? Probably a bit tiny weeny small for people at the back. I apologise for that. Um, we'll put these slides up on the website and hopefully you can listen to me talking and that's good enough for you. But we're going we're gonna to look at a couple of different things. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about goodness of fit. Okay, So this is the classic you know, statistical machine learning side of things. Understanding different ways of assessing the goodness of fit of the model. How do we empirically you know, test that? How do we do that in a way that we don't kid ourselves with the data? Okay? For some of you, this will be revision. You'll already know this. Hopefully there's little bits and pieces of nuggets that are, are useful to people. Because I'm a bit old school and I haven't yet learnt Python, I'm doing this stuff in R, so those of you who are new school, well, you'll have to bear with me. Um, but it'll all be up on the website and you'll be able to use the code and, and play around with that. And I've tried to keep it fairly simple examples to go with it so that you can actually see what's happening there. Um, so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about interpretability um, because even for those people who are in hardcore data science, if the model works and you've tested it properly, you know, then it should just be accepted. You still need to get people to accept it and there's, there's always some aspects of interpretability. And, and there's a scale there. And we're also going to talk about implementability and, and maybe if you're the, the one person rock star data scientist who controls the system and can implement it, well then, not much of a concern for you. You can code it up the way you want. But for a lot of us, uh, particularly for people like me who consult and have to you know, try and do it on client systems that are all locked down and those sorts of things, implementability is really quite important. And this relates to not just which model within a class we choose, but what class of models we actually select. Okay. So, I'm going to start by talking about the bias variance trade-off. Who's heard of the bias variance trade-off? Awesome. You guys are so good. That's awesome. Um, I was expecting less hands, but that is really, really good. Um, so bias variance trade-off. We, we have this thing, and, and for, for classes of models, and even across models, there's generally this idea of model complexity. Yeah. The more complex a model is, the better we can fit the features in the data. Yeah. So a more complex model is able to have more of the wiggly bits that allow us to fit the data exactly, yeah? Whereas a simpler model doesn't have that wiggly bits. And so we end up with you know, a trade-off. We've got bias, and the bias is the extent to which the, the model, the, the average model prediction differs from <coughs> the true stuff. So really it's a measure of how flexible our model is uh, in, in terms of being able to fit the data that we've got. And then variance, and variance really relates to our training process, and this is around we only have one particular instance of the data that we train on, or maybe several if we're cross-validating. Um, and, and how much does the model that I fit vary from time to time? If I was able to repeat that experiment, if I was able to take multiple training sets, and for each training set, how much does that model change from training set to training set? So what's that inherent variability, the, the extent to which I'm fitting the specifics of the data? Um, so as I said, increasing model complexity allows us to remove the bias or reduce the bias at the, uh, at the cost of increasing the variance. Um, and, and one of the key challenges, and, and a lot of the stuff that we'll talk to here, is how do we find that right spot along that bias-variance trade-off. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk to that. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to go back to here. This is the one that I'm going to talk to. This is from the Elements of Statistical Learning. Um, and what they've done here is they've actually gone and simulated model fitting. So they've gone and they've done 100 different data sets that they've created. And the blue lines are looking at the error on the training set. Okay? So looking at the error on the data that we're actually building the model on. Okay? And we've got model complexity along the bottom. Each of the little light blue lines is one 
iteration of this simulation. So they've generated a hundred different sets of training and test data sets and they've run through it. And the dark blue line is kind of the average of all of those things. And we can see one thing, as we crank up the model complexity, the error decreases on our training set. And that, that's typical of just about every modeling technique that we've got. Yeah? Um, you can see that, you know, maybe see from the light blue lines, that there's some variance there, but basically the more that we go through, the better we fit and the less variability we have on the training data set. Unfortunately, what happens is that as we crank up the complexity past a certain point, we're actually fitting the individual nuances of the training data set rather than the general patterns that we want to be fitting with our model. And so what we see with the red line, and the red line is the, the error on the, uh, on the test set, um, is we see that after a certain point that error starts to increase. And that's the overfitting. And so the, the idea behind what we're trying to do is really trying to nail where is that low point there, okay? And ideally we'd like to find, you know, given our training set, you know, what's that low point that we can get to that's going to give me, you know, the best, you know, the lowest predictive error given that I've got this particular training set. Turns out that's mathematically hard to do. We end up with a, a slightly related measure, but that's kind of where we're, we're moving towards, okay? I'm not going to talk to that one. So, as we work through here, I've, I've taken a lot of my inspiration from elements of statistical learning. I've taken this prostate cancer data set, um, and this is maybe not the nicest formatting of it, but it, it's, it's a relatively simple data set. There's about eight predictors. There's, you know, log of some volume, weight, age, uh, blood pressure, something else, something else, something else. Being a data scientist, I don't really care what the features are, except that, you know, LPSA, that's the thing that I'm actually trying to predict at the end, the ones that are sort of wrapped around here. But a really simple data set. It's eight predictor variables, one target variable that we're trying to predict, um, and you know they've done some splitting into a train and a test set there. So I'm going to use that, and I'm going to walk through a couple of simple examples. Is everyone familiar with the linear regression? Is anyone not familiar with linear regression? Cool. So I'm working through linear regression because it was the simplest model and I was writing these slides at about 11 o'clock last night so <laughs> my brain was a little bit fried. Um, so we're taking that data and we're going to have a couple of models to work through here. Our most basic model, um, for those of you who don't use R, um, the key thing with these models is this, this formula bit here tells us on the left hand side of the twiddle, LPSA, that's what we're trying to predict. And the thing on the right hand side is the things we're using to predict with. In this case, I've just stuck in one. And that says, fit a model with an intercept only, okay? So it's a really, really basic model. It is, I'm gonna predict the average value, is, uh, is my prediction on that. And as you can see, we've got an intercept, which is 2.4523, and it's significant. Um, which is probably somewhat meaningless. Anyway, basically means it's not zero. So that's our basic model, yeah? Um, then at the other end of the complexity we've got model 2 uh, which uses all of the predictors and I've explicitly listed them out there. Um, so this is now the other end of the spectrum. So if we think about moving along that dimension of model complexity, I'm my complexity parameter for a linear regression in this case is how many variables am I using to make my prediction? Zero variables really low complexity, we're expecting to see high bias, low variance there. At the other extreme, throwing in all of the variables, that's our low bias, high complexity end. Okay? There's some nuance there because we need to think what's the variable that we add in as we go along, and you'll see how I've dealt with that for, for, for other stuff, but for the moment we just say number of parameters is our complexity parameter. And then I did Probably not really statistically relevant, but I had a look down here and I saw, oh, there's a couple of variables that look like they've got stars or stars and single stars and points, so R is telling me that they might be a little bit significant. So as a kind of intermediate model, let's throw, you know, just those ones that were star um, in the original one. And, and they still come out looking marginally significant. Um, marginally. No, I didn't kill the intercept, and we could probably get rid of the intercept on that. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. 
So, so that, those are our models, and I'll, I'll come back to them because I'm going to use them just to show how some of these measures that we go through are used. So I'm going to start with the simplest one, um, <coughs> kind of the naive approach that a lot of people use. Um, R squared. Who, everyone's heard of R squared, yeah? Um, standard, you know, goodness of fit measure. Um, it, and it's the, uh, well, the coefficient of determination I hear people talk about. Um, defined as this 1 minus the residual sum of squares divided by the overall sum of squares. So basically, you know, what percentage of the variation in the model is what percentage of the variation in the data and the thing you're trying to predict is explained by the model? You know, sort of layman's way of explaining that. Okay. Um, so I've gone, uh, I've created a very simple function. I'm sure there's a function in R that does this, but for me, I've done this just for you know, to explanatory purposes. But a function, it takes y, that's the things we're trying to predict, a y hat, which is our estimate, so the output from the model, so two vectors of data in there. And I've got my definition here, so 1 minus sum of y minus y hat squared over the sum of y minus mean of y squared. Yeah? Now, when we run this through for model 1, and you can see I'm calling this R squared function. I'm just pulling out these, this LPSA vector. And what I've done here, and I kind of skipped over this as we went back here, but for all of these models here, when I trained them, I tra you know, when I built the models, I did them on the training subset. So our data was labeled and split into to two different subsets there. Um, so what we see, when we evaluate the R squared on the training data, we get zero, which is what we'd expect because our model is the same as the, the null thing here. Our model is just the mean of the y's. And that, when we actually go and test it on the training data, it gets a negative R squared. You know, it's, it's not actually it's doing the opposite of explaining it. It's not very good. Okay. So then we go to model two. And remember, model two is now at the other end. Uh, it, it, it's the full model. And so previously we were explaining 0% of the variation. Model 2, we say it's explaining 70% or 69% on the, uh, the training data, but significantly less on the test data. So here's the, the feature that we're looking at here is that the fact that you know, there's quite a difference in performance between the training and the test data. And, and hopefully people have seen that before in their own work. And then finally, we have a look at what happens on, on model three. And a couple of interesting points here. Um, so model three, slightly worse on the training data, but, but not that much worse. And again, slightly worse on the, um, on the uh, test data, but again, not too bad. Not too bad. But if we were using that, it just says, build the full model, give us everything, you know, give us all of the variables you can. Because one of the things we find with R squared is it doesn't actually penalize you for overfitting um, in there. And, and so really the, you know you can crank the model up as far as you want. And if, you, and if you're not splitting into test and train, so if you're only looking at the, the training data set and you're using R squared, what you'd find is that it would drive you towards picking up just a, a, you know, the model with the most parameters. Okay. Um, so hopefully that <coughs> the uh, the next one, and this was going back to some of the stats stuff, is you know, has everyone seen an F statistic on a regression model? No. I'll go through this quickly. It's you know, but basically an F statistic is effectively um, looking at comparing two different models, and, and it's basically a ratio of chi squared. Um, typically, it's formulated as a you know, does the model that we're fitting you know, is it significantly different from a null model with you know, basically just the intercept? But you can actually structure it in multiple different ways. So you can structure it so that you can look at comparing different models, and that's often quite useful for when you're looking at does this thing with the interaction or two terms separately work better than another one? So th there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, I won't spend too much time on that because it's a bit nasty um, and it'll go up, but effectively it's looking at, like a lot of things, sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Um, and we go through this, um, and so the first test that I do is now looking at model one versus model two. Um, by the way, this way of doing it, there's 
better functions for doing this. And now this is just so you can see the mechanics of how it actually works inside there. And we find that with the uh, you know the standard F test here, we get a really small probability that the, the null hypothesis is true. Um, big F statistics. So yeah, we're we're explaining something with the variables that we had. But then if we go along and have a look at uh, model three, and remember model three is the model that has only four or five variables versus the full eight variables that we had in model two. And now this is giving us something that's a little bit more information than we had with the R squared. So remember, the R squared told us it just gets better. Throw in more variables, so it's just cranking us further and further down the reduce the bias, you know, that side of things there. Now we get to this, um, and this actually says, well, how likely is it that this is a meaningful improvement? Now, probability out of this, when we compare model two with model three, shows us that really we're not actually gaining anything significant when we move from model two to model three. So adding those extra variables from a statistical point of view didn't add any additional explanatory power for us. Yeah, all make sense? Completely dull says. So that's a, that's a step forward. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk to, and it's a little bit of a you know, mishmash of different things. Who's heard of an AIC? Yeah. Good, good. So the Akike information criterion, or the Bayesian information criterion. So these things are starting to move forward a little bit more. And like the, the F statistic, what we're looking at here is how do we actually look at compensating for the fact that as we add more parameters, add more degrees of freedom to our model, we're actually increasing its ability to fit. So it penalizes for, for that sort of thing here. Um, I haven't bothered to try and show the calculation of AIC. I'm just using the AIC function within R. Um, and, and the thing with an AIC is that lower is better. So we've got two terms to it. We've got this negative two times our log likelihood. And so the better we fit the data, the, uh, the, the smaller that value becomes. Okay? But then we've got this penalty term here. In an AIC, it's two times the number of parameters. In the Bayesian information criterion, which is derived from a slightly different method, it has log of the number of uh, observations times the number of parameters. So both of them are, are penalizing. Every time we add an additional parameter to improve the fit of the model, it's giving us a penalty term that compensates for the fact that we're more likely to be overfitting the training data when we're doing that. And so when we have a look at that, we see that, OK, model one, we've got 218. We go to model two. And remember, model two is where we have all of the data. And we've thrown all of the data in. And it's gone and it's dropped it from 218 to 155. So that's all good. Um, but then when we go on model three, and model three, if you remember, model is the one with only you know, four or five predictors. And its AIC is even a bit better than model two. And the reason it's better is because the increase in predictive power that we get in the log likelihood isn't enough to offset the, the penalty from the increased number of parameters. Yeah? So that's all kind of good. Um, and it's kind of nice because these sorts of things here start to become sort of relatively independent of the actual model. As long as you've fitted the model using a likelihood maximization technique, you can compare these things across stuff. You can't compare it across different data sets. So that's one of the things. These, these no, there's no magic number where you can say that a, you know, an AIC of 200, well, that's a really good AIC. And if I get an AIC of 200, I, I know that I've nailed it. The AIC. It is completely dependent on the data, and it's only meaningful relative to other models that you've fitted. Okay. So that was kind of very brief, probably very thin overview of the, the traditional sort of statistical approaches here. You know, so these are the ones that are motivated by a model of the data, uh, an idea of statistical distribution that we assume, and then constructing tests that you know, will tell us in a certain probability whether we're passing things. So these are all motivated by statistical theory. If we come to data mining or machine learning, we actually come to a completely different approach on this. Okay? Uh, same objective, we're trying to avoid the overfitting. But what we're doing is taking something that's very much an experimental approach. And this is probably more in line with some of the more advanced techniques that are getting em employed in machine learning. This says, Let's forget all about the structure of the model. Let's forget about log likelihoods. Let's forget about probabilities and things like that. Really what I want to do is I want to do some experiments. I want to actually say, what did I, you know, train it on one set of data, go and test it on another set of data, 
see whether that works. And, and often people use this idea of three different data sets, okay? The training set, which we use to build our model. A validation set. We use the validation set for assessing the performance of models and comparing between models to select our final model. Um, and then our test set that we use once only at the end to quantify how good our final selected model is. Uh, and the reason that we only want to use the test set once is that as soon as we start to use it more than once and, and try to see in how do we get a better error on the test set, well now we're starting to fit to the specifics of that test set and we're breaking down the experiments. So really, and, and your pipeline might have multiple different levels of selection, so you may need more than three data sets. You might have a, a training set and a couple of different validation sets and, and things like that. And so you, you may need to do that, but typically three tends to work. Who's done that? Is it, and is it, yeah, good. People that I thought would have done that. Um, and that sort of stuff. So an extension of this idea um, is cross-validation, and, and this is probably starting to move a little bit closer to the state of the art, but I wouldn't pretend to be quite at the state of the art because I'm a little bit old school. I still use R, not Python. Um, but you know, cross-validation, um, so this is this idea, so similar to the idea of creating a holdout set, but this is now, how can we be a little bit more efficient with the data, yeah? So it's, we go back to looking at our train, at test, train, and validate, well, often people will say, we'll stick 50% in there, 25%, 25%. We're throwing away half of the data. Okay? Now, in the world of big data, we might be okay with that. You know? We might have plenty of data to go around and we can do that sort of stuff. But sometimes we want to maximize what we get from the small amounts of data that we've got available. Okay? And that's where we use something like a cross-validation. Really, what cross-validation does is it splits the data into K folds, often 10 folds. You know? So it splits the data into the different bits. So it's okay, we're going to take one bit out, we're going to use that as our validation set, build the model on the other ones, and then test it on that, use that to measure the error. Then we're going to go again, take the next one out and hold that as a validation set, build a completely new model, okay? Use the same parameters for building the model, but build a model on the new set of data, test that on the, the second one that we've held out. And so if we've got 10 different folds, we're going to have built 10 models for each value of the tuning parameter, and for each of those 10 models, we're going to assess it on the amount that we hold out. And so as we go through that, and we might do that for different values of the training parameter. So in this case, number of variables was our tuning parameter. So we would do it for one variable in our model, two variables in our model. Now as we go through that, we're estimating how does the error, the, the generalizing error of the model, so when we apply it to the held out data, how does that vary as a function of my tuning parameter. So really what the cross-validation stuff does is allows us to go through and work out how complex should the model be. Then at the end, once we've worked out how complex it needs to be, then we actually go and fit it to all of the data. Yeah? So it allows us to get some of the benefits of having a separate you know, test set, well, that's sort of a test set, separate validation set, but it allows us to use all of the, the data all at once. Um, because we don't have that test set, we're not going to get a necessarily as accurate a prediction of, of what the uh, generalization error is. <coughs> so I thought we'd have a bit of a poke around with that. Um, again, there's functions that will do this much more efficiently. Um, I've done some stuff. I've you know, gone and found the, the column names of the predictors. I've then done a correlation between them and the, uh, you know, <coughs> them and the um, target variable, order them in terms of correlation, and so really my, my model, I'm going to take the, the highest correlation and add them as we go through. I've got my cross-validation result data frame, so it's going to have a row for each different number of predictors from 1 to 8. I probably should have started off at 0. And I'm going to initialize it with 0 values for the error and the standard error of the error. And I'm going to sample 20 different times, so I can have 20 folds as we go through. Um, and then, again, really bad form in R because I'm using loops and that, but I'm doing it looping over the different um, number of model parameters and then looping over the folds. So I create my test set, which is that bit where the folds equals J. The train set is everything else, so not equals. I use my linear model to fit that. I then predict on the test data set 
to get my test predictions, calculate a root mean squared error, store that in there, and then once I've looped through all of the folds, I then calculate the mean and the standard deviation of that. So you can see it's really just it's repeating things over and again. It's using the, the repeating functionality, you know, the, the automation capability of a computer to test these things. So that's what the table looks like when we come out and we can kind of see that we get down to about a, a low at about five. Um, we get this ugly non-GG plot graph because I'm old school now. And it tells us that we're, it's about five parameters that we need to actually minimize that, which is roughly similar to what we had for model three. Uh, we went through there. Um, and so that's what we get. Slightly different, but you know, worked reasonably well. Um, there was an interesting article, I've put the, the link on the thing, so this will go up. Um, this guy, Alfred, Alfredo Motta, pointed out that when you're implementing cross-validation, cross-validation is one of those nice things because we're talking about building data mining and data science pipelines. It's something that we can automate. It does the tests and training. It's quite efficient and that sort of thing here. But he was pointing out that when you're doing cross-validation, you need to put all of the modeling steps into the cross-validation loop. So, for instance, in his example where he creates a random variable and then 10,000 other random variables and, you know, which should have you know, really no meaningful link between them, but because of random variations, some of them have significant correlations. Um, and his worked example kind of did the variable selection outside of that. Um, and you'd expect that predicting from random variables into random variables, you get a root mean squared error of about 0.5 or so, I think it was. But he was able to show, you know, something that when you, you did it, got a much lower cross-validation error. But then when you generated new data, it obviously didn't work. And so his point here is that when you're doing cross-validation, make sure you shift all of the modeling steps. So that's the variable selection, all of the bits and pieces into the cross-validation loop. You can't just do the final bits in there. You actually need to put all of the decision making in there. If you're building data pipelines, well, that's probably good because you should be automating things anyway and automating all of that sort of stuff. But that's one of the little things that can catch people out. Okay. Throughout all of this, and this is a little aside, um, we haven't really talked about what does it mean. You know, we talked about error, but I haven't really defined error. And throughout all of this, I've been using root mean squared error. So difference between actual and predicted squared, average across all of the observations, and then take the square root. Okay? But loss functions, are, you, know, you don't have to take that sort of loss function. Sometimes uh, you're better off using a loss function that is more relevant to the actual business situation that you've got, particularly in classification type problems. So if you know the cost of a misclassification and things like that, you can apply all of these things, the test and the train stuff, the cross-validation, you can use that but with a different loss function that actually simulates the sort of benefit or the sort of loss. So you're now optimizing on what's the business output, not just how well do I predict the particular numbers in there. Because Predicting on average may not be exactly what you need. There might be some observations that are more important, less important. It might be more detrimental to overpredict than to underpredict. So there might be asymmetric loss functions in there. So often worth remembering when you go through. And then the, the, the final point on goodness of fit. Um, I think most people will have seen on prospecti and things like that that past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. And we do all of this sort of stuff to try and make sure that we don't kid ourselves with the model. But sometimes it doesn't work, okay? Because sometimes the world changes and we generate data that we don't have in our historical data. So we need to remember that the situation could change. We need to have model monitoring. We need to have processes in place to track how things are going. I work with actuaries, so they think about these things in terms of control cycles, but it's, you know, don't assume that because when you build it on the data, that it's always going to work well. It's probably going to work well when you put it out there, but it can change, so make sure you track it. Um, I'm short on time, so we'll skip through these. Um, I've made an assumption here, so the type B data scientists think the interpretability is rubbish, but, um, but often you need to convince business people. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with this, you know, some models, and this is now with, not within a model, so a lot of what we've been talking about is within a model class and, and that sort of stuff, how do we choose? 
it can be applied across model classes, but this is, do I go and do my lovely gradient boosted machine or a you know, support vector machine or one of the nicer, newer machine learning techniques, or do I do a linear regression? Yeah? Um, nice thing about some of the newer techniques is they, you know, they're more predictive, they can you know, deal with things like that. Bad thing about them is that you're going to spend more time explaining it to a business audience. Okay? If you're in one of the lucky positions where you know, the business has actually set up and said, we need some nerds who talk about stuff that we really don't understand because we've heard that data science is good and we need more of that stuff, well then this may not be a big thing and actually having an uninterpretable model might be a positive. Um, <laughs> You're working in you know, credit decisioning, maybe not. You know, in a lot of other areas, there's going to be a business person that says, before I sign off on this, I need to be damn sure that it works. Okay? And, and, and so things like your linear regressions and your decision trees, and this is the, the non-technical aspects of selection, you know, think about how you explain that. But sometimes, you know, not everything's lost. There are ways to explain stuff that doesn't mean that you need to be able to describe the model in the page of PowerPoint. Yeah? Um, so SVMs, neural networks, you know, any of these sorts of black box things, they'll often have things like variable importance plots and partial correlation plots, some of the standard regression diagnostics. So think about whether some of these things that tell you about how the model functions can be used in place of being able to explain exactly what the model does. And sometimes that can get you across the line on that side of things. And then the final point on interpretability, um, some disciplines have standard formats for expressing stuff. Um, the, ma the one thing that came to my mind here was credit scorecards, which sort of reformat logistic regressions in weird ways to get standard score numbers out. But be aware of the domain that you're playing into, and you know, if you if you can make it look like what they've seen before in terms of its output, that's often useful. Often for getting it across the line. Um, implementation again. I'll move rather quickly through this. So. Um, there's, there's plenty of different ways in which you can implement models, um, and, th and this really depends on your organisation. If you're working for a big corporate, you're probably going to be you know, somewhat constrained to their particular technology stack in terms of what, you know, what you're allowed to implement. If you're the one-man band who happens to be the data science guru who solves all of the problems for your small company, then you've probably got a lot more, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot more options around doing that. Sometimes you can be a bit smart and translate complex things from one language into another. Um, depends on how much time you've got. <coughs> then the other bit, and this is something that you know hits me a bit, and, and this is not everyone in your team is, a, and I've, I've made this mistake a couple of times. You know, not everyone in your team is necessarily a data science star, and not everyone in your team knows Python or R or your favourite language of choice as well as you do. Um, means a couple of different things. It means that if you're the only person who understands how the model works and that, you're going to be the one who gets called up on Friday night and says it's not working, you need to fix it, you need to make it work. You can't hand it off to your juniors and things like that. So, I don't know. This is kind of why I use SAS from time to time. So I've got people who understand how it works, <laughs> but I'm training more people than I am. And then we talked about monitoring and free fresh there. So that's kind of all I really wanted to talk about. And I know it's been a bit of a, a broad smattering, but hopefully there was something in there for, for people. I, I think maybe some people won't have, will know it all, but you know, it kind of gives you a, a bit of an, a perspective on some of the stat ways of doing it, some of the train test side of things, some of the cross-validation stuff, some of the, uh, the hints and tricks and things like that. Um, further reading, this is this article which mentions type A and type B data scientists. That kind of worked really well for me. I, it's only passingly relevant to what I'm talking about here, but it's actually kind of interesting because it talks about a guy who's been a data scientist in Twitter for a year and his reflections on what he's done and what's been important in the, in the business and that side of things there. Elements of statistical learning, you know, seriously awesome textbook, has the advantage of being, having a free PDF available from the publisher. There's nothing you know, dodgy and back market websites about that. Chapter 7 goes through model selection in much greater detail than what I have done here, including some of the graphs that I use there. If you really want to understand it in detail and how all the maths works together, I'd highly recommend going and reading that. Um, if you want to know some of the older linear regression stuff, I really like this practical regression and over in R. It's one of the documentations in the, the CRAN 
side of things. Again, it talks through particularly the F tests and some of the older style stats tests. So if you're trying to learn up on that so you can argue with your resident statistician, that's a good book to actually have in there. Um, and then this is the article around cross-validation done wrong. I'll provide these slides to Fabian, so these will go up on the data science uh, meetup site, so you don't need to hurriedly scribble this down. I'll make sure this is available to everyone, um, and probably including the code, so you can play around with that yourself. Um, yeah, so that's that's the end of what I wanted to talk about, and I'll maybe, do we have time for a, a question or two? We shall do. Yeah. yeah I'll just put it on. Put it on. <laughs> Thanks for that. So hopefully I'm coming through clearly. And the question that comes to my mind, you're in a really privileged position. You get to consult with a lot of different companies. What is the mo most hilarious example of overfeeding that you've seen? <laughs> um, oh, look, it's slightly different to the predictive space, um, but it is very hilarious. It was a company that you know, was doing, and there's more segmentation side of things here. And they wanted to get a really good segmentation and really describe their customers well and that sort of stuff. So they went out and did a bunch of market research and did this, you know, cranked the hell out of their K-means and, and that sort of stuff, came up with these, you know, did some creative to describe these segments, had these, you know, seven wonderful segments to describe the customers who bought, you know, bought from their area, then got back to the end of that and uh, found that none of the variables they used were ones that they actually had on the database about their individuals. So their segments were not able to be mapped back to their database and not able to be actioned. So not quite overfitting, it's, it's more of an example of not really thinking through the implementation side of things, but, but that, that's kind of um, where you get to. Probably, probably the worst cases of overfitting tend to be where you're running really low on data. Um, so the, the worst cases I've seen have been um, in banks uh, where you're looking at trying to understand economic impacts on credit risk and things like that and where your data set might consist of seven or eight data points of yearly observations because that's all data that they've got um, and, and so you're treading this really fine line between can I have a predictor variable or not in here and maybe if I have two predictor variables in here maybe I'm overfitting and I'm really stretching the imagination here that this is actually something that's going to be generalizable, but we need to do something because the regulators say we need to have a model. So um, sometimes that, you know, that, that's probably the worst cases of overfitting that I've seen. Yeah? Thanks very much for the presentation. I was just wondering when it comes to cross-validation, if the size of the data um, you know, has any impact on the effectiveness of it? Um, if you're dealing with, say, hundreds of records as opposed to thousands, um, does that affect cross-validation in any way by subs um, splitting it to subsets? No, no, look, I mean, my, my understanding is that it's particularly where you start to get down to the smaller data set. And that data set that we're using there is only about, I think it's less than 100 records, so it's not a large data set there. So cross-validation um, is particularly good in those, those areas because it does make full use of the data set. What you will find, and, and if we go back to here, um, and if we have a look at the output of my very simple cross validation, there's actually more information than you get just than just the cross validation error. Um, you also get this standard error because remember each each per version of the parameter that we do, we get not one observation of the error, but we get an observation for each of the folds that we've done. So we can see how much that varies. And so for instance, in this case, you can see that really there's quite a lot of variability in my, my cross-validation error. And so that tells us that while it's kind of indicating that five variables is, is where I want to be, <laughs> to be honest, it's probably you know pulling things back. You can play around with things like how many folds you use and, and see whether that, that does good things there. But it's certainly usable for small data sets and it's probably more useful for small data sets because there you're actually looking at you know being able to use some of these test train type things while still using all of the data. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Do you think it's worth feeding a model if there's no implementability aspect at the end? Um, as in if you have no chance of implementing it? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do, doesn't it? 
Um, so if what you're trying to do is to understand the data so that you can actually get a business decision, then yeah, it, it quite possibly is. So I, I've done projects where, you know, this was for trying to locate where we put branches for, or you know, outlets for a particular company. Um, and we went through to, you know, fitting models and, and that sort of stuff. But in the end, it was the insight from the descriptive analysis that, that informed where they went to. So there is value in, in fitting models for, uh, for insight, for being able to interpret what the models do. The, there's a whole separate set of questions though, because I mean, when you go from a, a data mining or machine learning type thing where you're generally focused on how do I predict well, you tend to be less focused on do the coefficients in my model accurately represent what I'm trying to describe, um, because prediction is really all you're interested in. So some of the stuff that comes out of some econometrics and you have traditional stats around how you, you know, make sure that the coefficients are appropriate and the, the assumptions around linear models and that, they become more important if you're fitting more for the, the purpose of understanding the data than for making predictions. All right, can you please join me in thanking Daniel? Okay, it won't take too long of your time, but 10th House, I head up the analytics team there, analytic recruitment team. A lot of you know me, I've been involved in coming along to data science for the last three years. I thought it was about time to put back. So I guess we are sponsoring, so hopefully the video over the next week or so will be up of tonight's presentations. And then further on, they'll all be up there to go and look at if you can't attend the, the evenings, which is, which is great. Also, hopefully, we'll have pizza next time. So we'll sort that out as well. But from my side, 10th House, we basically, on the analytics side, look after all analytics roles. We go across a range of different marketplaces um, and BI, data science, uh, into the digital marketplace. Basically here to be of any help to the data science members. If anyone's got any questions around recruitment, it's always difficult, or if anyone's looking to hire people, I'm here to speak to. Thank you.